but we knew that for this one patch, the three biggest cheats just went completely offline and most of the small ones too. Uh, during that patch, uh, player reports for cheating went way up. So like in a world where we would have rounded the amount of cheating in League of Legends to zero, players disagreed. Players wow. thought that there was more cheating. And that was the first moment where I was like, wait a minute, this isn't a technical problem. Welcome to Building Better Games. Today we're talking about cheating. In nearly every game ever made, players have found ways to break the rules and seek an advantage. For multiplayer experience, their gain is often everyone else's loss. Games can literally fail because so many people are cheating that no one wants to play. Today we'll talk with Paul Chamberlain. Paul is a game developer and anti-cheat expert with a history of combating cheating all over game development, including Riot and Epic Games. We'll dive into when to start caring about cheating during development, what you can do to combat cheating in your environment, and why is there all this cheating in? Thanks for tuning in. Let's hit it. So, Paul, welcome. Anything uh, anything you want to add to that or, or hit for an introduction? No, it's a, a good intro. Um, but to just expand a little bit, I was the, the head of anti-cheat at Epic Games for Fortnite. And before that, I was the... Uh, head of anti-cheat for Valorant at Riot Games. So um, lots of experience with competitive games and the people who try to get an unfair advantage. The thing I want to touch on briefly, the the motivation, like why is it that people cheat? And I understand that this is not limited to video games, but let's pretend it is for now. There are the, the people who just want to win and just think cheats are another way to help them win. There's the people who just want some control over their lives and like if that means burning down the game experience for you <laughs> by, you know, killing everyone or even without cheats running down mid, um, there's those people. And then there's perhaps the the saddest group, which is the I, I, I've been wronged and this is the only way I can right that wrong. And sometimes that's yeah. fighting fire with fire, but other times it's... Um, you nerfed my favorite champion or hey the matchmaker keeps putting me with people who are bad and i'm good and they're bad and that's just not fair and so like however like these motivations often need to be attacked separately like mm -hmm. um for for example the people who just want to watch the world burn are often the easiest to catch because they're the ones who are doing it most blatantly they're using Spin bots that are just glitching out their characters to avoid bullets. They're using a heavy machine gun while running and headshotting people across the map. Uh, but the people who manage to kill half the battle royale lobby before they land on the island, and you're like, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, well, get those out of here. Um, the most insidious are the ones who are just playing to win, and they they just like, hey, cheating is how I win because. They, they will dial their cheats down if they have to. They'll be like, well, I can't win if I'm banned. So mm -hmm. I'm going to get yeah. just enough advantage out of my cheats to avoid being banned so I can win. Because mm -hmm. avoiding the anti-cheat is just part of the game too. Um, yeah. And like the, those are the ones that undermine trust because it gets to the point where you can't necessarily easily tell the difference between someone who has a very mild like wall hack running and someone who doesn't in high level play. It's like, oh, they just got good game sense or are they cheating? Yeah. And yeah. if that kind of thought flourishes in your community, then it's gonna undermine trust even if no one's cheating. And so Paul, um if I came to you and was like, I want no cheating, mm -hmm. right? Like I I am a game company, I'm the developer, this is a competitive experience, it must be clean, I want no cheating, okay? Go ahead and make that happen, Paul. Thank you, I'm so glad you're good at your job. Okay, so if you want zero cheating, literally zero cheating, um, don't release the video game. Don't turn the servers on, <laughs> don't release the video game. If you want almost no cheating, like basically zero, we'll get as close as we can, but you wanna actually release the game, because you know, I get it, I like video games too. Um, <laughs> Look, uh, make it as expensive as possible. Uh, $10,000, let's, let's say. Um, make them come to your headquarters with their $10,000. Uh, 
and you uh, take a bunch of biometrics from them. Um, and then only let them play on your campus. Like, you have the room where they play the video game and they go sit there. Like, <laughs> and, okay, so, you know, obviously that is not commercially viable. But if you're talking about a mass market competitive experience, then obviously you want as many players as possible. So uh, charging anything at all for your game might be out of the question. So it's really mm -hmm. a, a sliding scale of like, hey, games that are free to play and very accessible are more likely to have, have more cheaters because if your account gets banned, you just make a new account. It didn't cost you anything, whatever. But all the way to this is an impossible to get game. You'll, you'll get fewer cheaters. But again, it, it really comes down to just what, what are your product goals? And like mm -hmm. part of the, the frustrating part, if you're on the product side is you don't really know what your options are. Cause like it, it's totally reasonable to ask for zero cheating. You're like, I don't want cheating in my game. And like, it's sad when someone like me says, um, I don't think that's possible. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's also hard to articulate what the breakpoints are. You say, hey, um, you want low amounts of cheating. Like you're, you're like, we want to not have egregious cheating in this game. And you're like, okay, well then we'll do a quick check to make sure that there's no obvious exploits. Like I can make myself invulnerable and we'll um, maybe install something like easy anti-cheat and we'll make sure that we have for our leaderboards, we keep track of all the game records so we can be like, oh, that person's suspiciously high on the leaderboard. How many games did they play? How many times did they win? What's their favorite gun? And you're like, oh, that might be fine. But if you're like, no, we want to be industry leading, that might be, hey, we need to spin up a team of 15 engineers and another 15 operations people, and they're going to spend the mm -hmm. entire development cycle of this game making anti-cheat technology for this game. Um, yeah. And obviously, yeah. that's a huge expense. That's like a whole other game team for a lot of studios. Um, and... Yeah. Um, you just kind of have to like figure out what your game calls for. And it, it mm -hmm. like, if this is a, we decide to do nothing and in the future we decide to do something and that's fine, then yeah, you shouldn't prioritize anti-cheat if you, you think you do it later, but um, it'll come down to your product again. Like one of the reasons Valorant went so hard on anti-cheat was because this initial trust was uh, super important to this kind of game. And that if yeah. they got a reputation of having lots of cheaters, <laughs> then they might never recover from that. Um, and also in Valorant's case, it was a common pain point of players of the genre. If you played tactical shooters, you were mm -hmm. probably negatively impacted by cheating at some point. So you could make it a product pillar to say, hey, we're going to be really good at this. A game that I've been working on that's actually coming out really soon. In fact, I'll, I'll probably shout it out right, the, right at the end. Uh, Omega Strikers. Um, we, we've done a fair bit of anti-cheat work for that because it's a competitive game, but not a, a Valorant level of anti-cheat for that game. And part of the reason is, is we'll see what happens. Like, we believe that the risk of cheating in this game is relatively low compared to something like Valorant. And so we will have an opportunity to react to it. If things get out of control, we will we'll right. be ready. Like, we've been preparing ahead of time and we'll be able to respond both with uh, process technology, but also communications to players before it's like done damage we couldn't couldn't recover from. Well, that, that also sp speaks to the idea of prioritization. And, you know, this podcast goes out to game dev leaders and producers and whatnot. And the reality is there's a million of these variables out there around, you know, oh, how good is your, your net code? How good is your anti-cheat? How good is a million things, the game itself, right? All these different things. And each of them takes investment of resources and people to attempt to solve. Yeah, anti-cheat is in service of your, your product goals. So if, if you find that adding, adding anti-cheat to your project is instead compromising your vision for the product, then you've probably done too much of it. Like if you're yeah. like, hey, we're cutting essential features from our game like for anti-cheat reasons, you're like, no... Anti-cheat is to serve the product vision, not the other way around. Um, yep, I love that, I love that. I think w one of the first things that came up for me when we decided to do this podcast was like questions that I didn't expect to ask myself, like what is cheating? 
You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's actually not as straightforward a question or an answer as oh, it yeah. might seem, right? Mm -hmm. And and there's a whole separate conversation about exploits and what falls under the category of an exploit and, and what is sort of above board and or below board about using right. an exploit. I played Cal I for a season and like I, you know, when we'd practice with the team, like one of the things we'd practice was like animation canceling. Like it was mm -hmm. really, really important. Like, and you were literally exploiting the this weird esoteric crap within the game to try to get an advantage over your opponent. And so, you know, again, is that cheating? As I think about it as a as a game developer, and then I try to imagine myself as like a layman or a player, it's like this is such a broad topic to even like understand what yeah. does cheating even mean. The same with like what's an accessibility tool versus what's a cheating tool. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if I can't bunny hop because I just have a, a mobility limitation where I can't hit the space bar at a consistent rhythm, is it cheating for me to use a third party tool that can just macro press something. space bar? Yeah, oh, it's just wow. a macro yeah. tool. I've never even thought um, about that. That's and, a really interesting point. Um, it's gotten, and like that's a very simplistic example, but for example, in Fortnite, um, which is primarily played on, on consoles, I mean, also PC, but there's a huge console scene, there's a lot of question about what third party peripherals are considered mm -hmm. legitimate because a lot of them have basically macro capabilities where you can program a yeah. bunch of automated button press combinations. Actually, Bl Blizzard with WoW, uh, with all of these sort of raid assistant. Yeah kind yep. of tools and stuff had a trouble they had to like really analyze that and go into it and be like what is a bridge too far um yeah uh actually for for people who are interested in this there's a youtube video by dan olson um i think his channel is called folding ideas called why it's rude to suck at warcraft um <laughs> and it basically goes into this discussion of like uh if you're raiding competitively in World of Warcraft, is it rude to just not have every single add-on? Like, uh, if you just mm -hmm. turned up to a raiding guild in World of Warcraft with no add-ons, are you are you like bad manners? Is this a BM? Mm -hmm. Are you throwing? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that was we, you would require people yeah, in the yeah. guild. You'd be like, yep. "Hey, you all have to be on Deadly Boss Mods version yep. blah, right? Like, because that's what we're going to be playing on, and we don't want you to be the person who doesn't hear the." tone or whatever. Yeah, imagine being a healer that turns up without any assist mods for helping you, you know, keep your yeah. heals per second up and targeting the right people. Like, um, And this was uh, uh, something that we were talking about a lot when we were developing Valorant is like, how can we make it so that the competitive experience for Valorant is the default experience so that the people playing the game at the highest level are playing it the same way as everyone else. And mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the philosophies we brought to this, this line to get back to your question of like, what is cheating? Um, and for, for many of the games I've worked on, it's any, any tool, any external non default thing that gives you a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. The other problem though, is that the developers don't want to be in the business of ruling individual pieces of software or individual techniques in or out because mm -hmm. if you start doing that it's like anything that you didn't specifically say is is banned could be considered yeah. permitted and in some ways that's just not the best place <clears throat> to spend your your attention when you're you're looking for anti-cheat you should sort of zoom out and start with a why do we need an anti-cheat and also like what product goals does it serve and then sort of use that to like figure out what's best for, for your actual game. Because it's very easy to be like, oh, okay, um, Fortnite uses easy anti-cheat. Easy anti-cheat is a commercial product that you could just buy. Okay, we've got a cheating problem. We're just going to buy easy anti-cheat uh, software. We'll put it on our game. We're good. And it'll help, but unless you understand what you're trying to achieve and what your problem actually is, it might not be the right solution. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of expertise in anti-cheat in most game studios. So if you do suddenly find yourself with a cheating problem, the first thing you're gonna reach for is like, is there a standard solution? And if mm. you research well, what is a standard solution for anti-cheat, you'll get things like easy anti-cheat, Battle Eye, De Nuvo, um, and you'll just be like, oh, well, we buy that, we put it on the game, and we're, we're good to go. But 
what if your cheat is someone pointing a camera at the game? What if you're, what if you're actually your cheat is um, you're a poker game <laughs> and people are colluding? Uh, it's very unlikely that something like easy anti-cheat will help you if your problem is colluding players. Or, so there's right. there's a takeaway here which is really interesting, and I think, you know, I, I I know you've alluded to before, which is this idea that there's sort of a a graceful marriage between the anti the the sort of goal of reducing cheating and understanding what the product is. Because if if you ever assume that cheating is sort of like this generic bucket, this is kind of my takeaway from what you're saying, and you apply a generic solution to it, it's unlikely to really have the impact that you would like. And and also given that anti-cheat expertise isn't ubiquitous in our industry, you're very likely to even misunderstand what cheating means in your context if you don't have that conversation. Yeah, so it, it should all begin with a uh, understanding of the product, the game that you're making and where it could, could go wrong. Uh, for example, in PVE MMO games, there's still a bunch of cheating, but usually to break the economy, whether it's automated, right. yep. um, game plays itself and farms for you, or mm -hmm. whether it's um, exploits like, hey, I'm going to abuse an RNG mechanic so that um, my random loot's always the best or wh whatever. And those might still be very important to your game and need anti-cheat attention, but that's very different than, uh, say, you were running an online chess ladder, like competitive chess online you're like you have competitive integrity concerns there but they're most likely going to look like uh people colluding for win trading or people not being who they say they are and like um bringing in ringers mm -hmm. or uh using computer chess ai engines and like those are very different to um i have a bot that f uh, mines for me in ultima online um or yeah. But it will look different again to um, something like Valorant, where it's a, a fast-paced action game where the skill execution is is very important because of the high lethality of the shooting. Um, so you'll have a different type of cheat there. Um, one of the examples I really like to use is in the game Among Us. Um, very, very popular, blew up. It's a multiplayer game. It's PvP. It... Uh, for a long time, there was a lot of cheats available, but I didn't do a lot to sort of damage the growth of the game as far as I can tell because of the way that you play Among Us, which is usually you're in a lobby mostly with people you know or people you're getting to mm -hmm. know, and if one of them cheats, uh, or even if you just suspect them of cheating, even if they're not cheating, or even if you just don't like them very much, you just stop playing with them. You can I, slander them on Facebook. Exactly. In front of their just, friends and family. Yeah, you could yeah. be like, hey, this person wins too much. We're not going to play with them anymore. Like, they might not have even been cheating. But, like... Um, right, yeah. But games like League of Legends or Fortnite or, like, many free-to-play competitive games that use matchmaking systems, you don't have that option of being, like, I don't want to play with that person because I think they're cheating. Um, and so it really... Like in Among Us's case, they did add some anti-cheat cheat tech and made some improvements that made it much harder to cheat. But I could um, understand why it wasn't like a huge priority for them because of the way that their game works and the, was designed and their product strategy. It didn't rely on players having a high amount of trust in the integrity of the experience. While something like a, a Valorant, highly competitive game, esports, um, if people lose trust in the fairness of the game, it will undermine the entire uh, game yeah. product because you, yeah. you need people to want to spend time getting good in the game. You need a population of people queuing up for matchmaking and you need everyone to have, have a good time. And all of that's undermined if there are cheaters or even just uh, an appearance of it being unfair. One of the reasons I um, reached out to you was because I saw some videos. There was, if you're familiar with Tarkov, Escape from Tarkov, Extraction Shooter. Extraction Shooters, uh, not in the same way of Valorant, but they certainly have the same sort of desire for competitive integrity because there's a lot of people and they're all trying to achieve different mm -hmm. objectives on the map. And they, there was a video that, that came out, uh, The Wiggle That Killed Tarkov, and it was really interesting because someone basically said that a very high percentage of the games 
they were able to identify somebody else who was cheating. So basically they, they built the through, throwaway account. They would only run around with a knife, but they were just like exploring the concept of cheating because Tarkov is a game that is so punishing. Death is so punishing in a game like that, that if I think that there's a decent chance I'm going to die to cheating, why would I keep doing this? Mm -hmm. So then Battlestate started banning a ton of people. But I think when you count up all the bans that they've had, it's close to 40,000 people that they've banned. And now you're going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's probably an average of, you know, what, 10 people in any given raid. 40, what, how big is this player base? That is a classic anti-cheat problem of we want everyone to know that we're doing something about cheaters. But if, if we say the numbers, are we just going to put it in people's head that there's a lot of cheaters? Like you're mm -hmm. like, hey, we banned 100,000 cheaters. Some players will be like, oh, wow, look, they're doing a great job. They take this seriously. Look at how many cheaters they banned. And other players are going to be like, there was that many cheaters to ban? There must be more. There's cheaters everywhere. Um, and extraction shooters are kind of like the, the new hard mode for anti-cheat. Like I, I thought working on Valorant that a tactical shooter was going to be sort of the, the pinnacle of difficulty for anti-cheat programs. But... Uh, extraction shooters as a genre you take a lot of the same combat mechanics and then uh, graft it with a persistent economy that's like the entire progression system mm -hmm. and so now you have like the the uh, MMO like style hey we cheat because we want to accelerate our progression through a resource system but the way that manifests is through a uh, first person shooter style wall hacks aimbots etc in a highly lethal environment um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a tough time to be making an extraction shooter. Um, I mean, it was similar to battle royales um, before, where um, high lethality shooting yep. gameplay um, with the additional wrinkle of if you have a hundred people in a match, your chances of any given match having a cheater in it is going to be much higher than a game that has uh, like three, six, ten players. Because yeah. it, imagine a world where 1% of your players are cheating. If it's uh, evenly distributed across play sessions, then your your battle royale with 100 player sessions is going to have on average one cheater per per session. And in a game like, like a, a PUBG, the one cheater is very likely to win. And like that yeah. means that almost every player in your game is going to be negatively impacted by a cheater, even if the number of cheaters in your population is quite low. Um, I say quite low, but 1% would be very high. Uh, if your game has 1% mm. of its players cheating, that's like sort of crisis level for a lot of games. I mean, depends mm -hmm. again on, on the game. Because uh, yeah. imagine a 5v5 MOBA. Uh, if 1% of your players are cheating, that might mean like if they were evenly distribu distributed, that would be 1 in 10 games you'd, you'd see a cheater, which is like pretty bad but you've got to remember that we're talking about uh matchmaking systems with like you doing skill-based matchmaking and if your cheat yep. makes you better at the game then you'll congregate in the higher end of the skill brackets and so it will get to the point where even with say a one percent cheater population it might be that ten percent of your top tier of players are cheating which would be and they're the ones that are on twitch yeah exactly on twitch on reddit the the ones that who are the opinion makers so like that would be sort of existential it, it really shows how the competitive integrity discussion goes far beyond the idea of cheating but it's mm -hmm. but it's that trust again is yeah it's sort of such a delicate thing that you're always and kind of trying to balance so you know when i first started thinking of anti-cheat this way was actually after uh something that we did on league of legends in 2014 um so we created sort of the first anti-cheat team for league of legends in sort of late 2013, early 2014. And we uh, changed a whole bunch of the game's net code. Um, we just changed sort of the, the networking layer of the game. And at the time, that's how the vast majority of cheats used um, worked, was that they they would communicate to the server on the behalf yep. of, of the client. They would send packets to the server that did things. And so we just changed entirely how that worked. Not just for anti-cheat reasons, but for like a bunch of other technical reasons. And so there was a period where that patch went live where we were very confident that uh, there was 
almost no cheating in League of Legends. Like, League of Legends always had like really good, uh, like a low level of cheating for a bunch of bunch of technical reasons that turned out were accidents, but like great tech choices in hindsight. Uh, but we knew that we had created it for this one patch. All like the the three biggest cheats just went completely offline, and most of the small ones too. Uh, during that that two week patch. Uh, player reports for cheating went way up. So, like, in a world where we we would have rounded the amount of cheating in League of Legends to zero for this two-week period, players disagreed. Players wow. thought that there was more cheating. And that was kind of, like, the first moment where I was like, wait a minute, this isn't a technical problem. Like, it, it, you, we... For a brief moment in time, we had the technical solution that was preventing cheating, but it didn't solve the product problem, which was players don't feel the game is fair and like you, you can't really just get on on twitter or reddit and say hey i'm a developer at riot games we just fixed all cheating believe us because like <laughs> it's not because reasons yeah well let me let me pivot us to the next phase of this conversation yeah. because like i really want to start talking about um because i mean we're, we're we're in a very luxurious position to have one of the leading experts here on this and like I want to ask the question, like, what are the main ways that companies can battle this problem or make progress on this problem? Because, when, you know, what you just said popped something up for me, which is I would imagine if the problem itself is not purely technical, that would imply that perhaps the solutions are right. not always technical as well. There, there so, are processes, uh, yeah, not just code or, to write. Or, you know, it's, you know, I don't even know this. I'm super curious. But like one of the things... I remember talking uh, to folks about at Riot was sort of the hacking, like literal mm -hmm. hacking and, and malicious, like beyond the context of just cheating, but malicious technical mm -hmm. attacks on the product or on Riot itself. And one of the things that's interesting is like a lot of companies nowadays are like working with like, you know, wh what is it, white hats? And like there's so there's like this sort of social engineering aspect of the problem as well. And it's so so I'm actually wondering like what comes up for you as sort of the major areas that you attack this problem strategically mm -hmm. when you when you see this come up yeah so so the first thing to do um <clears throat> is to understand your your product and where it might be vulnerable to these kinds mm -hmm. of things like do you have an in-game economy i uh, do have a real competitive player versus player environment what do your pro pro progression systems feel like to players? Do they wish that they were faster and what lengths would they go to to, to make that happen? Um, once you've kind of figured that out, you can start, um, well, first of all, you can just start by talking to your, um, your engineers for, for the, and designers that are responsible for those systems and say, hey, what can we do here? Because sometimes it could be as simple as we tweak the economy value so that it feels more generous, or hey, we make it so that dying in PvP isn't as huge a progression sink. And those might not be appropriate for your game. Like an extraction shooter is about it being harsh when you die. Like, mm -hmm. um, but you might just find that, um, like for example, if you're making a CCG, you're making a card game, it's, Legends of Runeterra, Hearthstone, something like that. You might, in your design phase, be like, "Hey, we, we want to want players to trade cards. Like this is a staple of paper collectible card games. You trade with people, and from an like anti cheat perspective, this would create a whole bunch of new avenues for bad behavior. Like suddenly, if I can trade with people, then there's going to be a black market economy. Someone will mm -hmm. PayPal me, like Venmo me five bucks and I'll give them a card. Or um, there'll be uh, scam bots where I will trick people into giving me their cards or good deals, or even just hack them. I'll send them a link that like fishes their password so I can, can do that. <laughs> and you might be able to go to your design team and say, hey, how important is player to player trading in this game. And they, they might say, ah, oh, we think it would be fun, but it's not actually that important. And you'll be like, great, can we, can we cut it? Cause then we don't have to worry about all these other problems. Um, mm -hmm. And, but uh, even if they say, absolutely not, we, we need trading where uh, this is the vital player fantasy is it's a collecting fantasy rather than a competitive fantasy. You're like, okay, well then 
you just know that that's going to be one of the pain points where you, you've got to pay more attention. And so the first thing you can do is measure things. Do you have the telemetry in your game to know what players have in their inventory? Like what cards have they unlocked? What trading activity has happened? Um, do you have a model of what is normal and what is not normal? Like you're like, hey, this account has four hours of playtime. They shouldn't have every single card in the game. Things like that where you can at least measure the problem that you're having. So that the first time something weird happens, you may, may have seen it in your data before you saw it in your community. Or if your community is like, hey, something scammy is going, going on. Like a guy just sent me a DM that, with a really weird link. Um, and then you can follow up with an investigation and being like, oh, okay, well, let's see if we can find a pattern of behavior. Um, this is both for like your first type of anti-cheat, like the, in some ways the best kind of anti-cheat you can have is using your knowledge of the game because you're the people who make and operate the game to find abnormal behavior. Like, yeah, I, yeah. you know, rootkits, uh, you know, kernel level anti-cheats great for some things, but if you can just have some razor that's like, people who own this many cards are cheating and these people who own less than this are not cheating. Like your game probably doesn't have that. That's very rare, but just the closer you can get to that, the closer you are to understanding the size of the problem, but also your first steps towards fixing it. Um, like a real uh, a old school League of Legends e example. Like you were talking about real hacking. Uh, one of the things people were doing for a while in League of Legends was uh, doing denial of service attacks against the game server they were connected to. They would do this anytime they were losing a match. Because what would happen is if you did a denial of service attack against the server, everyone would disconnect and the game server would shut down. It would be like all my players went away. Like I'm, I'm not, obviously not useful because all 10 players have left, so I'm going to shut down. And that wouldn't get recorded as a win or a loss. Um, mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, that's a pretty technical attack. Turns out the the way you defeat that attack um, is if you really expensive networking infrastructure. But if you don't want to do that, look for players that have suspiciously high win rates. Because if, if someone mm -hmm. is in a matchmaking system and they're winning 80% of their games, uh, it might be because they're doing a denial of service attacks against like any game that they're losing. Um, right. And uh, so like that that kind of thing is re really helpful. Like once you've identified what systems, what parts of your game might be susceptible to cheating, the next step is measuring those things. Then you might you might be able to just take corrective action at that point. You're like, oh, we can detect people who are doing bad things. We're gonna punish their accounts. Or that might lead you to the next step, which is technical controls. And this is where you, you figure out, well, how are they cheating? You're like, okay, well, we're, they've figured out a money duplication glitch. Okay, is it, is it something we have to fix in our code? Um, right. And really, like, you don't need to jump straight to, hey, we need, um, we need to go license some technology here. You should probably instead get there through a process of understanding the, the problem you actually have and um, slowly marching towards a, we understand the problem, we understand how it's happening, now we can uh, do something about it. Um, for certain types of games, you can just sort of jump to the end. Like if you're making a shooter, you're like, okay, well, aimbots and wall hacks are very common in shooters. I would probably go, well, I'm just gonna put easy anti-cheat on it preemptively because I know that in these types of games have these types of problems and uh, like, um, mm. Operations teams are very important for anti-cheat. They're the people who review uh, the reports of cheating from players, but they're also look at the data that comes out of your anti-cheat tools. They're also the people that do the investigations of what cheats are available in the market, but they can also help you track down who's making and selling these cheats. Um, it also turns out it's a very cutthroat industry and one yeah. of the best ways to find out who's making a certain cheat is to ask their competitors. It's like, hey, do you know who, who makes this cheat? Um, they probably <laughs> won't tell you if you're like, hello, my name is Riot Games. Cool. And then, Paul, anything you want to plug? Where should people go to find out more about you, 
Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, for now, I am still on Twitter. Um, I'm at Arkham, A-R-K-E-M on Twitter. Uh, I run a game studio called New Avalon. You can follow us on uh, Twitter again at New Avalon Games. Um, more uh, recently, I've been working on a game called Omega Strikers from Odyssey Interactive. It's launching April 27th on all platforms. If you like uh, competitive air hockey with anime characters, uh, we've got you covered. It's going to be great. You can find it phone, PC, or console. Great. And then uh, we will put all those in the show notes as well as the uh, Dan Olson video that we referred to earlier. Um, so expect to see those there if you want to see them. All right. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I want to quickly go over a summary of the awesome things we talked about with Paul today related to cheating and anti-cheat. So keep these five things in mind as you consider the role of cheating and combating cheating in your game. Number one, understand your product goals as the first step towards an effective anti-cheat strategy. Number two, cheating is going to happen. The question is not how to prevent it entirely, but how to mitigate the negative impacts on your players and game. Number three, Anti-cheat isn't just about using technology and tools. It could also be about game mechanics, economy, general design, or even parties outside of direct game development like we talked about legal, etc. Number four, the definition of cheating may not be as obvious as you think. You have to talk with your team about what it means to cheat in your game and how you want to address it. Number five, understand what telemetry or visibility in your game is required so that you can determine the difference between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Did you enjoy this content? Every two weeks, we will deliver one actionable step that will increase your chances of delivering a successful game straight to your inbox. Join game developers across the world and sign up for the Building Better Games newsletter at www.buildingbettergames.gg newsletter. Again, that's www.buildingbettergames.gg forward slash newsletter. And that will also be in the show notes. Thanks everyone for listening.